In this video, we're going to be talking about the myth of Baptist successionism and the myth of the booklet, The Trail of Blood. This is a little booklet, and it claims that Baptists go back to John the Baptist and that they can trace their lineage back to John the Baptist. This video is going to be two parts long. In the first part, this part, we're going to talk about the many errors in this book, blatant historical errors that are just wrong. And we're going to demonstrate this historically, and the attacks that they have on the Catholic Church are also wrong. I'm sure the author of this booklet means well, but he's mistaken on very many things in history. And then part two, the second part of this video, will debunk Baptist successionism and show without a shadow of a doubt Baptists cannot and do not go back to John the Baptist and all the groups that they claim that go back through the centuries on, that were actually Baptists were not, in fact, Baptists, did not believe Baptist doctrines, and in fact were closer to Catholic than they were to Baptist. But in this particular video, I hate to say it, but I'm excited to debunk the many errors in the Trail of Blood because they confuse many people, and many people have been duped by this book, even though historians don't even take this book seriously. In fact, most Baptists don't even take this book seriously. It's only the fundamental brand of Baptists that actually believe this, and not even all of them. In this booklet, The Trail of Blood, it starts out by saying that the earliest Christians, the pure, pristine Christians who followed Christ and refused to give up the Christian faith, even under torture, even under persecution and death, they fought for the faith and they held the pure Christian faith. And it talks about how they were persecuted on and off for about 300 years, even until the 4th century. And at that time, there was a fierce persecution against the Christians, and the Roman Empire couldn't break them. They were still growing in numbers, which is actually one of the true parts of this book. They were growing in numbers. That is true. And the Roman Empire could not stop them, no matter how much torture and death they gave to the Christians. And so the book goes on to say on page 16 that Constantine came to power. And it was at that time that he decided to make a truce with the Christians. Here's what the booklet says. So under the leadership of Emperor Constantine, there comes a truce, a courtship and a marriage proposal. The Roman Empire, through its emperor, seeks a marriage with Christianity. Give us your spiritual power and we will give you our temporal power. To effectually bring about and consummate this unholy union, the, a council was called. In short, this booklet is claiming that Constantine merged Christianity. The pagan Roman Empire couldn't beat Christianity, so they decided to join them. You know, give us your spiritual power, we'll give you our temporal power, and the two become one, a subsisting body which is really, in essence, the same thing. So it's kind of a joining of old paganism and Christianity, and it becomes the Catholic Church. But of course, this is the farthest thing from the truth. And as someone who has a master's in church history, it actually hurts to hear this history be mangled because it's just not true. And in fact, the Edict of Milan, which it talks about in 313 AD, had nothing to do with the merging of the Roman Empire and Christianity. It had nothing to do with Catholic Church coming to Constantine and them you know, kind of coming to a marriage proposal and agreeing to work together and all of that sort. It had nothing to do with that. In fact, what the Edict of Milan was, it was a freedom of religion. It was allowing Christians to practice their religion without being tortured, without being persecuted, and without being killed. And it obligated the Roman Empire to pay back the confiscated property of the Catholic Church. The churches, the lands, and the things that were confiscated were given back to the church. And if you don't believe me, a Catholic, listen to what non-Catholic sources say. Here's the Encyclopedia of Britannica, and here's what they have to say. Quote, the Edict of Milan, a proclamation that permanently established religious tolerance for Christianity within the Roman Empire. It was the outcome of a political agreement concluded in Milan between the Roman emperors Constantine I and Licinius. The proclamation granted all persons freedom of worship, whatever deity they pleased, assured Christians legal rights, including the right to organize churches, and directed the prompt return of Christians' confiscated property. The edict effectively established religious toleration." Unquote. So, again, the 
Encyclopedia Britannica makes it clear that has nothing to do with a marriage proposal. It has nothing to do with swapping powers and working together to take over the Roman Empire, or as the Trail of Blood says, to take over the world. I mean, that's what it says. It wa They wanted to work together to take over the world, but that is not what it was about. It was about allowing Christians to worship freely and allowing them to have religious freedom and being able to worship their God. And anyone in the Roman Empire could worship the way they wanted without fear of persecution. So this book is absolutely wrong when they say that the Catholic Church became the Roman Empire and vice versa because no such thing happened. And anyone who has studied actual history will see that the Catholic Church, what we believed during the time of Constantine and after, was also believed before. And we have several videos on that if you're interested. The Betrayal of Blood goes on to say that at this time, after the Edict of Milan and after the Council was formed, the hierarchy was a definite development which led to the creation of the Catholic Church. So after Constantine was coming to power and after the Edict of Milan, they kind of created this power which led to the creation of the papacy. And together, the papacy and Constantine called a council, an unholy council, the booklet says, which Baptists and other Christian denominations refused to come to. But of course, this is wholly untrue also because there were no Baptists at this time. In the fourth century, there's no such thing as a Baptist or any other Christian denomination. They just didn't exist. And we're going to see that in our next video. But there weren't any other Christians except Catholics at this time. Baptists were started in 1608 by John Smith in Amsterdam. And every historical society, every history book and every encyclopedia Every historian reaffirms this claim that the Baptists were started in 1608. They didn't go back to John the Baptist. And as we said at the beginning of the video, most Baptists don't even believe that just because there's no actual history. In fact, if you don't believe me, go to BaptistHistory.org and look up this. And they say that the Baptist denomination, the Baptist Church, was started with John Smith in 1608. And in fact, Baptist.org says the exact same thing. And if you don't believe other Baptists, you can look up the Encyclopedia Britannica, New World Encyclopedia, or others, and they all say that the Baptist Church was started with John Smith in Amsterdam. It came out of a congregational movement from England and moved over, and the whole history is given, but there's no history. Even the Baptist website itself says that there was no Baptist history before the 1600s. More than this, the hierarchy was established well before the 4th century. It was established in the Bible. The hierarchy of the church is in the Bible. And all of the earliest Christians before the 4th century believed in the hierarchy of the church. And in fact, if you look at passages like Matthew 16, 18, and 19, where Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom, which symbolize authority and primacy, or Matthew 18, 15 through 18, where Jesus gives the apostles the power to bind and loose, he doesn't give everybody that, not all Christians, he gives the apostles a special authority. In John 20, 21 through 23, Jesus breathes on his apostles his authority and gives them the authority to forgive sins and reconcile people back to God. Matthew 28, 19, he gives his authority to the apostles to go out and preach to all the nations. I mean, there are so many verses about the laying on of hands in the Bible, the passing on of that authority, and all of the earliest Christians believe this. And if you don't believe me, listen to just a couple of the earliest Christians and what they said on the matter. Origin in the 200s says this, quote, On a presbyter, however, let the presbyters impose their hands because of the common and like spirit among the clergy. Even so, the presbyters have only the power to receive the spirit and not the power to give the spirit. That is why the presbyter does not ordain the clergy, for at the ordaining of a presbyter he but seals, while the bishop ordains. So we see here that the bishop has the power to ordain and pass on that authority, and there's different branches from deacon, presbyter, bishop, and so on. We could see a hierarchy here. Listen to what Ignatius of Antioch says in the second century, writing in 107 AD. Quote, Therefore it is my privilege to see you in the person of your God-inspired bishop, Damas, and in the persons of your worthy presbyters, Basus and Apollonius and my fellow servant, the deacon Zoshin. What a delight is his company, for he is subject to the bishop as to the grace of God, and to the presbytery as to the law of Jesus Christ. So even St. Ignatius talks about a hierarchy throughout his writings. Deacons are obedient 
and subject to the clergy, to the presbyters. And the presbyters, the clergy priests, are subject to the bishops and so on. And so clearly, throughout the earliest writings of the church, long before the fourth century, we see a hierarchy of belief. And if you look at the list of popes in any encyclopedia, you will see a list of 264 popes, 30 of those popes existing before Constantine. So how could the papacy come into existence in the 4th century when there were over 30 popes before the 4th century? I mean, has the person looked up history? I mean, all you have to do is look up any list of popes in the encyclopedias, in history books, and you will see... 30 popes before Constantine even was in his mommy's belly. I mean, if you look up in the 200s, 252, you will see Pope Dionysius writing to heretics, excoriating them for denying the divinity of Christ. He was saying that nobody can deny the divinity of Christ and still remain a Christian. This pope was writing in the year 252, almost 75 years before Constantine. So clearly, the Catholic Church was not started in the 4th century. And clearly, the papacy was not started in the 4th century. And clearly, Catholic belief did not start in the 4th century. It started long before. The Trail of Blood goes on to say that in the year 416, the church and the state together made a law that required infant baptism. Everyone, all infants, had to be baptized. Now, of course, infant baptism did not start in 416, nor was there a law that just made everyone be baptized whether they wanted to or not. I mean, if someone did not want to baptize their kid, they did not have to. But the Catholic Church re recommended baptism as early as possible. Um, and we have a whole video on infant baptism if you're interested. We're not going to go into it at length here. But we show in the video on infant baptism that it's historical, that it went back to the time of the apostles, and it's biblical. And if you're interested in infant baptism and why this booklet is wrong and why it did not start in 416, then you can check that out right there. As an aside from that, they, the booklet goes on to say that because of infant baptism, the majority of Catholics within a few years were unconverted. Now, that might sound nice, but there's no evidence. He gives no facts. He gives no statistics. He gives no sources or quotes or anything. He just says they went unconverted. But there's no proof. And he gives no proof, and we're just supposed to take his word. It's amazing how many anti-Catholic uh, sources and anti-Catholic books make these sweeping claims and generalizations, but without any whisper of proof or evidence or anything at all, we're just supposed to take their word. But of course, history tells a different story. Real briefly, this booklet gives a summary of how we moved from true Christianity to false Christianity, which, of course, is false in itself. And it says that the gradual democracy became a preacher church government, which is not true. It says it changed salvation by grace to baptismal salvation, which is also untrue. Yes, baptism is necessary for salvation. According to John 3, 5, you have to be born again, which means baptism. And we have a whole video on being born again. But the Catholic Church has taught for 2,000 years that salvation is is by grace. That is by grace alone, as Acts 15, 11 says, that we are saved. Because without grace, we can't even have faith. Without grace, we would never approach baptism. So it's grace alone that saves us, and it's grace alone that draws us to the heart of God and gives us the desire to follow him and be baptized and have faith in everything that else that comes with it. So he's creating a false dichotomy here that doesn't really exist. He goes on to say that there was a believer's baptism and then it became infant baptism. But in fact, the Catholic Church still has believer's baptism. We just have both. We have infant baptism and we have believer's baptism. For people who come into the church, they are baptized as adults. But as we said already, infant baptism has gone back to the time of the apostles. The Dark Ages begins, he says, in 426, and Christians begin to persecute Christians, and the Catholic Church basically turns into this killing machine and just wipes out all Christians who are found with the New Testament, found reading the Bible, and it's just a bloody past, dripping with blood, and it's just drenched in blood. I mean, the, it goes on to describe this, which we're going to talk about in the next video, but it's all false. It talks about how the Catholic Church took away religious liberty and all of these other things, but it's all false. And I can't wait to do that video to show that it's not true. I mean, in fact, they don't even quote anything. They don't show anything. They just say, oh, the Catholic Church killed everybody. Oh, the Catholic Church murdered everyone found with the Bible. But literally, 
There's no evidence of that. So people will say John Wycliffe. Well, first of all, that was much, much later than what's being talked about here. But he wasn't murdered for reading the Bible. He wasn't killed for reading the Bible. He wasn't killed for having a Bible. They don't even look at the facts of history, which is why they're confused. I mean, if I read this book, I would hate the Catholic Church too, because it makes it seem like the Catholic Church is a killing machine who literally systematically wiped out all the true Christians, the pure Christians. And the few that made it through these dark persecutions throughout history are the true Christians of today, the Baptists. <laughs> but of course, most Baptists don't even believe this, and it's not true. One of my favorite quotes from this book comes from page 21, where it says that the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD promulgated a doctrine known as Mariolatry, which required Catholics to worship Mary. It says that at first it created quite a stir that you had to worship Mary, and there was a kind of battle between true Christians and the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church won out, and so today Catholics worship Mary. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. I'm sorry. Um, it's it's silly. Mariolatry? I would wonder, and this is a challenge for any Baptist who's still watching this video, or anti-Catholic who's still watching this video, I challenge you. We have all of the Council of Chalcedon's writings. We have all of the writings of the Council itself. You can go read it online for yourself. We have it here in our library. There's nothing anywhere, ever, not one word about worshiping Mary in that council, about establishing a law about Mariolatry, about anything regarding worshiping of Mary. You know why? Because the Catholic Church condemns it. <laughs> the Catholic Church condemns worshiping Mary and condemns worshiping anyone or anything other than Jesus Christ. Now, that may be a shock to anti-Catholics who have been literally brainwashed by anti-Catholicism and anti-Catholic arguments, but if you actually read Catholic documents and not what people say about us, we condemn anyone or anything that's worshipped other than Jesus Christ, because only Jesus Christ is God. Only Jesus is God. So how could Mary be worshipped? She's not. She's only a mere human being. She's highly honored in the Catholic Church, but she's not worshipped. Some people say, but Catholics do worship Mary. I don't know a single Catholic ever in my many years of living that has ever worshipped Mary. Now, I'm not saying there aren't any. Let's say there are. They're going against their own church because the Catholic Church condemns it, which means they need to be educated. They need to be informed. They're doing it the wrong way, and they're going against God. They're going against the commandments. They're going against the Bible, and they're going against the Catholic Church if a Catholic actually worships Mary. But the Catholic Church condemns that outrightly. The booklet goes on to say this, quote, the distance from God to man was too great for just one mediator, even though that was Christ, God's Son, the real God-man. Mary was thought to be needed as another mediator, and prayers were to be made to Mary, and she was to take them to Christ. This was talking about Mariolatry and why the Catholic Church developed the doctrine of worshiping Mary. Can't say it with a straight face. Um, it's just, it's not true. I mean, Christ is sufficient. Christ is infinite. Christ is all-powerful. He is the one mediator. Yes, Mary can pray for us, but we can pray for each other. If Christ is the God-man, and if he's really the true mediator, why do we need to pray for each other? We don't. Why don't people just go straight to Christ? Why are we praying for others and asking for their prayers in return? We shouldn't be, according to Baptist theology here. But the reality is we can pray for one another, and it doesn't interfere with the mediation of Christ. Christ takes Mary's prayers, and Christ takes our prayers, but one perfect mediator takes all of our prayers and brings them before the Father, and he's the only one who can. This booklet goes on to say that all writings in the Dark Ages were collected by the Catholic Church and burned. If they were not Catholic, then they were not part of the Catholic Church. They were all gathered up and burned. But of course, this is wholly untrue. Sure, the Catholic Church did burn heretical, false writings that were completely heretical and against God. But Protestants did the same thing. Protestants burned each other's writings to show that they were wrong and to keep the pure, pristine faith that they thought was from God. If Luther thinks this is from God and Calvin and Zwingli come up with something else and, and they start confusing Luther's followers, Luther's going to burn their writings and vice versa. And so they would burn each other's writings. I mean, this is just the way it was back then to keep the pure faith. But the reality is the Catholic Church didn't burn all writings. And in fact, the Catholic Church is the reason we have many secular writings and many classics today that probably would have gone extinct and be lost to history. But because the Catholic monk copied uh, Cicero and Horace and Virgil and Pliny the Younger and countless 
others, we still have them today. The monks not only copied these, but Catholic universities taught these. People in the Catholic universities did not just learn the Catholic side, they also had to learn the other side. They had to learn both sides and be able to come up with a coherent argument. In fact, in the universities, they actually had to argue for the other side convincingly before they could argue for their own side. So they had to learn intellectually to know both sides, which means they had to read both sides. So the fact that people say that the Catholic Church burned all books is just preposterous and it's not based on actual history. So the last thing we want to talk about in this video, and literally there are hundreds of errors in this little booklet, but it would take like three hours to do a whole, maybe four hours to do all of the errors in this video. But we want to talk about one more, specifically indulgences on page 24. So it goes on to talk about how indulgences were uh, invented. And they were invented to bring in money, and they started selling indulgences, and they wanted people to give money in order to buy their way into heaven, basically. And listen to what it says. It's very interesting. This is kind of entertaining. It says, quote, a very large credit account must somehow be established, a credit account in heaven, but accessible to earth. So the merit of, quote, good works as a means of salvation must be taught. And as a means of filling up, putting something in the credit account from which someone else could draw it, the first large sum to go into the credit account in heaven was, of course, the work of our Lord Jesus. And he did no evil, and none of his works were needed for himself. Then, in addition to that, all of the surplus of good works by the apostles and by all the good people living thereafter would be added to the credit account, making it enormously large. This is craziness, absolute craziness, that this person is mistakenly thinking that the atonement and the work of Jesus Christ is not good enough, that there has to be more. And in fact, that Jesus, you know, he's good because he's God, but then all of our good works have to go in there as well so that people can pull. That is not the way indulgences remotely work. And people don't understand indulgences, first of all. They say, oh, you can get an indulgence to forgive your sins. Indulgences don't forgive your sins. You can get a hundred indulgences, but if you don't confess your sins to God, you're going to hell because indulgences don't forgive sins. So it's basic Catholic theology that these people don't understand that makes it hard for me to even believe them and to take them seriously and what else they're saying. But the fact is Jesus Christ in his work on the cross is the bank account. That is correct, but nothing needs to be added to the work of Christ. That's not the way indulgences work. And in fact, the way Catholics are saved is through Jesus Christ alone. And the Catholic Church teaches that. Again, if you're anti-Catholic and you're watching this, you're probably like, the Catholic Church is so bad. They teach this and this and this, but we're only going by hearsay, which is why I challenge anti-Catholics to actually do research, because anti-Catholics are generally very gullible. They just believe whatever they're heard of and told about the Catholic Church, but they don't do the research for themselves. Here's what the Catholic Church itself says, and I guarantee you it says that Jesus is the only way. Even if you get an indulgence, it's all the work of Christ. It can only be the work of Christ. Christ is the work of salvation. Listen to what the Church says. And this is speaking about justification and merit and how we're saved. This comes from the Council of Trent and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it says, quote, Justification has been merited for us by the passion of Christ, who offered himself on the cross as a living victim, holy and pleasing to God, and whose blood has become the instrument of atonement for the sins of all men. The next quote comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, paragraph 1996, and it says, Our justification comes from the grace of God. The grace of God is still the work of grace. <laughs> you know, not grace or baptism, not grace or good works. It's all grace. Grace is favor and free and undeserved help that God gives to us to respond to his call to become children of God, adopted sons, and partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. And I could quote more, but this video is already really long, but the bottom line is the Catholic Church teaches that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Grace saves us. It's his atonement that saves us. Uh, purgatory, indulgences, they're not a second chance. You can't buy your way into heaven. That's not how it works. We're going to have a whole video on indulgences. But the bottom line is people are taking what they think the Catholic Church is and attacking it falsely, as opposed to what the Catholic Church really is, 
which is true. You can't say something is false if you don't even get the arguments right in the first place about the Catholic Church. And in our next video, we're going to be seeing that all of the Christians, so-called, who have been through history that the Baptists claim were actually Baptists under various names, were not even remotely Baptists. They didn't even believe Baptist doctrines. And in fact, many of the sects that they say were true Christians were Baptists were heretical. They believed in multiple gods. So it just calls into question the sanity and viability of this booklet in the first place. If they can't even get basic history and basic doctrines of the Catholic Church correct, how are they going to get anything else much deeper and much more difficult to correct? So this booklet, it's no wonder historians don't even take it seriously. And again, not Catholics, historians, other Baptists don't take it seriously. So if you've been duped by the trail of blood, do an in-depth research on this and you will see that it's wholly false and untrue. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please help us to expose these anti-Catholic lies and half-truths. Many of these Protestants are honest. They're sincere. They want to serve God. They hate the Catholic Church, but it's not their fault. They've been lied to by books like this that are totally and completely erroneous. So please pray for these people. And please help us to get this message out there by sharing this video, by liking, and by commenting down below. And if you haven't and you like this video, please subscribe to it. And don't smash that bell notification icon because we're Catholic. Give it a little kiss kiss, a little tap, and like this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Please pray for us, and we are always praying for you.